Thank you, John. So I'm here to talk to you about how we are optimizing resources in Kubernetes. Uh, how can you reduce costs? How can you uh, improve utilization on your Kubernetes clusters? And I'll show you what you can do with open source Kubernetes. I'll show you what we have built on top for the business use cases. And hopefully, you'll get some ideas that you can go back and use, uh, use yourself. So that's what uh, you already said. I, one thing that people know me for, for good or bad things, is um, I started the Jenkins Kubernetes plugin. And, but I'm happy that you all may, uh, made it here right after lunch instead of going and take a siesta, which would be the proper thing. I hope you got coffee, because we're going to be here for the next two hours. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so I work at uh, one team at Adobe. We use Kubernetes at Adobe. A lot of people ask me, oh, I didn't know Adobe uses Kubernetes. Yes, we do use a lot of Kubernetes stuff. And we're hiring, by the way. And I work at the Experience Manager product. Uh, it's um, a, a bit of an introduction so you understand what type of application we run. It's an existing Java OSGI application with all the things that happen with Java and the JVM. It was already distributed before running on Kubernetes. Uh, it uses a lot of open source components from the Apache Software Foundation. We use a lot of open source and we contribute back. It has a huge market for extension developers that write their own extensions, plugin, well, components that run on Adobe Experience Manager. And they write modules that, uh, that run in process on AM. So this is an interesting use case because we run customer code in our multi-tenant clusters. So on Kubernetes, on the cloud service, AM cloud service specifically, um, there's also on-prem and managed services, but on, on, on the cloud service, we have more than 25 clusters, and we keep growing every month. Because this is a content management system, people want to run this in multiple regions, so they want to run close to their customers. So we, run, we have US, Europe, Australia, Japan, and we keep adding new regions as needed. And uh, because customers can run their own code, we also have uh, limited permissions uh, for security reasons. We use namespace to provide the scope, uh, so different customers uh, cannot see each other's data, uh, networking and all that. So network isolation, we use, make use of quotas uh, and permissions to, to isolate tenants. Um, I like to refer to it as a micro monolith because it's not, our use case is not the, the typical use case. I have one deployment and I scale up to 200 pods or something like that. We have thousands of deployments that are very similar, but uh, they also scale, but it's not one deployment that scales a lot. It's all thousands of deployments that are smaller. We have multiple teams building services on top of Kubernetes and, and application level. And this is also important because we want a way to, to make these uh, optimizations and these ways to, to scale that are like orthogonal to the developer teams. If we don't want to chase people in each team to do something, sometimes it's, it's, be, it's way better to have a way that applies to the whole cluster uh, or, or we um, or we don't have to uh, require each team to do something. We do that for them. So those solutions are way better. We, we use extensive, uh, extensive usage of resource requests and limits. So if for those of you that are newer to Kubernetes, request how many resources are guaranteed, limit is how, limit is how many resources can be consumed over those uh, number of requests. And we play with this a lot to make sure that we can scale while keeping the cluster stable. And we apply them, well, and you can apply them onto CPU. Um, if, you are at, uh, if you have more CPU usage than you requested, you may end with CPU throttling. If you have uh, for memory, uh, the limit is enforced. Uh, if, if you try to use more memory than the limit, uh, the, the, um, the kernel is just going to kill your, your workloads. 
And for ephemeral storage in Kubernetes, this, that's also the request limit that you can set. And if uh, you have pods that use more ephemeral storage than the, uh, than the limit was set, you're going to get pod eviction. So you have to play with all these uh, resources, and you have to play with requests and limits in a way that you don't uh, need a huge cluster to run, and uh, your workload is not going to crash all the time. On AM, this is a specific case for Java applications. Anybody here running Java on Kubernetes? Yes, a lot of people. So if you probably know, Java, the JVM, is going to take all the memory on a startup and manage it. So you set the heap sizes. And if you say, I don't know, 75% of the memory is a heap size, and you have one gig, it's going to take those 750 megs and use it all the time. And Kubernetes doesn't have any visibility on what's actually used, what's not. The JVM just takes it. And so that kind of makes it a bit harder to get uh, visibility on what happened. On the JDKs over uh, 11, it, uh, the JVM will detect how much, li how, many li how much limit is set on the memory level, and the JVM is never going to try to use ma 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 more than that. In the previous versions, it was just using, by default, it would take the host memory, and that would always per typically cause crashes. So to start on the things you can do to improve usage, uh, first thing, obviously, Kubernetes cluster autoscaler. Who is using the cluster autoscaler? Everybody's using the cluster autoscaler. Unless you're running on bare metal, you're going to be use the cluster autoscaler to increase and reduce the, the cluster size. Uh, you can base it on CPU and memory requests. We always leave uh, room for the spikes because you don't want new pods to require nodes and the time it takes for a node to come up and so on. And we have multiple scale sets for different region, for different reasons. Specifically, we want a different availability zones. We have multiple worker tiers, uh, Kubernetes nodes uh, as node groups on, on Azure. Uh, we have the maximum number of nodes that a cluster can have defined. Uh, we don't want to scale past the limits we know are safe. And we use the least waste scaling strategy to, that will minimize the, the idle CPU. I put a rough number there, 30, 50. I mean, I don't think anybody on their same mind would not use the cluster autoscaler. Um, maybe some very specific use cases. But if we had to run clusters at full capacity all the time, the amount of money we would be wasting would be uh, crazy. So things that you can see, uh, these are examples, uh, real examples. So you can see the cluster of the scaler going up and down in the number of nodes in a cluster. Uh, some spikes that could be, I don't know, maybe it's a day of the week, or maybe it's business hours, or something like that for our customers. And we have these typical uh, patterns. Sometimes you will see other patterns that are a bit more scary, right? So this going to the, to the limit of this cluster size. And this was because of a bug uh, that triggered the autoscaler to, to scale up. So you see how at some point the autoscaler went crazy. And uh, because we have the limit set up, uh, this didn't keep going. But you see, once we figure out what was happening, um, the, the number of machines just started uh, stabilizing and going down. The other typical option you're going to have is the horizontal pod autoscaler. Who is using our horizontal pod autoscaler? A lot of people use it. So you, this is basically creating more pods of a deployment when you need them. And we have. Uh, Two ways, two metrics set up to the, to the HPA auto scale on CPU and HTTP requests per minute. For CPU, it's a bit problematic because you could have periodic tasks or startup tasks that spike the CPU. So imagine somebody makes a mistake or a customer makes a mistake, 
and on a startup, the CPU spikes, and especially with Java, uh, maybe the garbage collection, things like that. This would cause a cascading effect. So if every time a pod starts, there's a spike on CPU, that would trigger another pod to start up that will also spike on CPU and so on. So it's something that it's gotta, you gotta be careful about. Um, AM specifically also needs to be warm up on a startup um, because we are serving content, we want caching to be warmed up and a bunch of other reasons. And for us, like a request based auto scaling is uh, better suited. As long as customers don't have expensive requests that if you have one request that takes a lot of resources, then the number of requests is not an indicator to, to, to scale up. And this probably saves us like 50 to 75% of uh, than running at full scale, eight pods, 10 pods, or whatever for each customer, right? So this allows us to run from two pods for, we use two pods for HA, um, for production environments. Uh, we have one pod for other environments, but uh, we, don't, we don't go to the, to the run on the limit all the time. And here, it's another example um, how you see that the number of pods more or less matches the request per minute that we get, and the request per minute is, again, it's a very typical example of business hours, night, uh, number of requests that you get. And the pods uh, just match. Another option you have on Kubernetes is the vertical pod autoscaler. Anybody using the vertical pod autoscaler? Less people, okay. So this is um, basically increase and decrease the number of resources used for each pod or each deployment. So you don't scale with more pods, you just take one and scale, uh, increase or decrease the number of resources. Something that is problematic is that it requires the, the restart of the pods. So if you have something that is very fast to start, that may not be a problem. If you have something that takes a long time to start, then that's a problem. This could be set on automatically or on the next start, so you don't are, you're not killing pods continuously. You could just say, oh, if this pod gets rescheduled or restarts or something, apply the changes then. But this also makes it uh, slow to respond and it can exhaust. Um, if, if you scale, if all of the pods that you have running on the same node they scale up at the same time, you can also exhaust the resources of the node. So we only used it in our case on developer environments, and we only used it to scale down if needed, and only for some containers, because um, yeah, because of all the reasons, it's not very good for for our production uses. So this saves us a bit, uh, a small percentage, five to fifteen percent or something like that, of the resources for developer environments. Now, some things that, you're, that are outside of Kubernetes that we build ourselves for a use case. The first one is hibernation. And it's very similar to the scale to zero problem that uh, you can solve today with the, um, with the horizontal pod auto scaler and custom metrics. You could do a scale down to zero. Or if you use Knative or something like that, or functions, then it's, it's something like that. But this has a twist. Uh, we don't, first, our pods take a while to start, some minutes to start. So it's not like you can just bring down to zero and scale up again. And we not only scale down a deployment, because most of the things you're going to find in Kubernetes here are deployment specific. So this is more of a business concept of a customer environment. So when a customer environment doesn't have any resources coming in for X amount of hours, we just scale it down. And we scale the whole environment, which is several deployments, and we also delete ingress routes and other objects that may limit cluster scale. So uh, we hit a, um, a limit where we have a lot, because we have a lot of environments running, thousands of environments in each cluster, we have thousands of ingresses, and at some point, that becomes a problem for reprogramming the ingress uh, controller. 
So on hibernation, we also delete those ingresses. This is implemented very easily, very simple. It's a cron job that just goes to Prometheus, checks the number of uh, requests in the last n hours, and uh, if, if it was not accessed, it just scales, it hibernates it. And for the hibernation, because we, we change the ingress route that the customer would use or the user would, would use, and just point, we point them to, an, to a website where they can click a button and dehibernate it. And this, we are playing between 60 and 80 percent. Uh, we do it for some, only some environments, we, which we call sandboxes. So it's like development environments or developers, customer developers, different, more like playing playgrounds. And the savings we get, as I said, is 60, 80 percent. So this is huge for us because it, it allows us to, to pack a lot of things in the same cluster. And it's very stable in our case. And then at some point, what we're gonna do is, if you haven't used your environment for X amount of months, we're just gonna garbage, clean it, delete it, garbage collect it, um, whatever, whatever you want. Um, Another thing that we've built in collaboration with other team at, at Adobe is a project called Arc, which is automatic resource configuration. So one thing we noticed and we analyzed is that uh, a lot of services request more memory and CPU that they are actually using. So Arc can transparently uh, reduce these CPU and memory requirements. So if we see that uh, one cluster has a utilization rate very low, like 5, 10% or whatever on like CPU, we just apply a percentage to the whole cluster or to the specific namespaces. This way, what I was telling you before, we have different teams doing different applications so instead of telling them you go and analyze what's your usage and do this and that, we, can ap we just apply this all across all the namespaces, specifically for like sandbox um, stage clusters and non-production. We just go and say everything, everything is, goes down. It doesn't touch, touch the limits, so the side effects are a bit uh, limited. Um, most likely you're not gonna trigger on Java the out of memory and the kernel kill in your pods. Uh, obviously, if, if for whatever reason, um, many pods that use a lot more resources than they request happen to be in the same node, then you could get CPU throttling and some side effects. But then is, that's what, I mean, what we analyzed, right? We look at the use, utilization and what are the chances of high resource using pods being in the same node at the same time. So that's risk benefit thing. ARC also has the recommender part that leverages historical metrics at the deployment level. So it will give you recommendations on annotations um, about the optimization of, of the deployment on how much is being used. So it's a bit like VPA. Uh, it's a bit like VPA, but it gives you historical data and also applies to the whole cluster namespace, all that and um, people don't have to uh, know about VPA or having to create a new CRD for VPA or anything like that. So it's automatic for them. So we, we can dial down at the, I mentioned, request at the cluster or the namespace level, and this kind of give us a 10, 15 percent um, reduction. So, in this graph, for instance, at the, we have the number of requests, the blue line, and we see that it's very consistent that the utilization is very low for this. 
you got to think also that our workloads are very specific. Um, we, ha we are serving content. If there's no users coming to the website, there's no activity. But you cannot just shut it down. So you, we cannot scale it to zero in production. Um, but then uh, we rely on HPA to pick up the pace if needed. But we always have to have like at least two pods running all the time, even if there's no traffic, because at any point in time there could be, right? So we have the utilization pretty low in this cluster. Uh, we have the requests, and we have the original request here. And you see that the actual request is a percentage lower than the, than the requested, uh, that the original request, and this is what we are saving. And then we have the limits, which we always uh, put pretty high, just in case we have uh, spikes. So we don't have to use HPA if we have a spikes, temporary spikes. And yeah, the only risk is having very noisy neighbors in the same node. Some questions that I anticipate is why do you use ARC and not the VPA recommender? Um, and this is a, a team that where Joe is working. So the, um, ARC allows them to, to do the full control of the recommendation engine. And it, the implementation, as I said, was at the cluster level. So you don't have to deal with a specific uh, deployments. It just applies to everything running in the cluster. OK, so to sum it up, we have uh, a few optimizations. Uh, I didn't mention FinOps in the whole talk. Maybe I, sh I should or I shouldn't. <laughs> because that's all the trend now. So we have from the Kubernetes ecosystem, we use the cluster autoscaler, HPA, VPA, and there's some new things coming, um, like the HPA down to zero, that was very interesting, that was already out there uh, some releases ago. VPA, I don't know if it's ready or not, but I think there's the possibility, or will be the possibility, of changing the requests um, live without having to restart the pods. I, I read about that. Um, I don't know where, what's the status right now. Internally, we built this hibernation, very simple hibernation, more business case oriented, and Arc, which is not so business case oriented, but it's more like Kubernetes cluster thing. And they apply at different levels, application level and, and infrastructure level. And hopefully, a combination of them will help you optimize and, and, resource, and re reduce the resources you need. So I hope this will be useful to you, and you can go and, and apply some ideas on your use case. And now I'll take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, we have one question here from, uh, from the online audience. They want to know more about ARC, if it's open sourced, and if you have any plans to uh, let the community access it. <laughs> no, it's, it's not open source. Um, I don't know what the plan is. This is uh, from another team. Um, do you have anything to say, Joe? Uh, yes. It, it is in the works. We, were, we just. <laughs> About about a month ago, there was a you know talk about this. Um, st stay tuned. We should hopefully have something coming out in the summer. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I think there's another microphone uh, a little bit further down as well. So if you want to line up and ask questions there, and I'll I'll pass this around up here. Hello, thank you for the talk. Yeah. Uh, I want to know how like after deployments scale down, how do you deal with uh, resource fragmentation to scale down the nodes itself? So typically, we have the workloads distributed across multiple nodes, so mm -hmm. the cluster autoscaler will not scale down the nodes. Yep. But if you like, could move some workloads to some nodes, you could scale them down. Yeah, I think that's all tunable at the auto, auto cluster autoscaler, if you want to do that or not. We have a lot of uh, things that come and go. So we don't have very long-lived pods. So we don't have that oh. problem that much. Okay. We, I don't know, I don't, probably we don't have anything more than a few days old. So it's, 
continuously. We never ha had any issue with that. And we also applied updates more or less frequently, which may trigger node restarts and evictions to happen and so on. But we have enough movement of workloads that we never had to worry about that too much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yes. So there's a microphone as well. Please, there's a microphone like halfway down the room, so if you want to line up down there so I don't have to run across the whole room. Hi. Uh, hi. Here. Uh, uh, I have a small question about uh, how do you know how much resource to give to each pod uh, in the request CPU and the uh, memory? Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I don't speak about auto scaling, about static uh, number. Yeah, uh, that was just like a trial and error experience over time. Um, so we started with some numbers, the different teams building applications, they come up with those numbers and we just help them see what's happening and, ha and have providing them the Grafana dashboards and things like that. And each team looks at it and says, you know, uh, well, I'm using more, I'm using less, I need more, I need less, and they keep refining it, the initial numbers. Did you thought about uh, to build a system or a platform that will say to each uh, deployment what are the optimal uh, CPU and memory that it needs? Yeah, so our recommender would do that and would uh, set annotations at the pod levels and tell them what's the like usage, real usage, if they want to use that. We, we go with some, to some teams, we go and tell them, you know, look at this because it's wasting a lot of CPUs and we can let them know. But we, my, my whole goal is that each team is vertically independent. So we provide tools and they, are, they own it. So we just tell them, uh, unless there's a problem, we just let them know, you know, uh, there's, you should tweak it or not, and it's up to them to do it. Yes. Do you instruct them to put um, requests and limits yes. for both memory and CPU? We enforce that on the pull request level. Uh, we use Rigo policies with ConfTest. And we have a set of policies, typical ones like security policies, um, like uh, you should not mount secrets as environment variables, you should not uh, do some things, mount things from the host, and then you have to put requests and limits. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, yeah. Yes. Thank you for your talk. Uh, you mentioned a couple of times that uh, the risk of uh, maintaining your request quite low, but the limit's quite high if you've got noisy neighborhoods. Do you have any recommendation for that type of a scenario? Yeah, it depends on your use case. In our case, on average, um, statistically, we don't have that much of that problem. Um, but if it, yeah, it depends on your business case. Uh, the only solution is to raise the request and make sure that they all are using some sort of like node, uh, tying things to nodes, and then having nodes that you know they're going to be very busy and use labels. Uh, to get them a schedule on those nodes and then having nodes that are not so busy and having other, th m and you could have workloads that have less resources and more spiky things in one node and more resources and more. If, if you use like machine learning workloads, right? They are, those are gonna be like 90%, 95% CPU all the time. Otherwise you are just wasting money. Uh, you want them to be up there. In our case, we, we cannot, because it doesn't depend on us, it depends on how much traffic we're getting. We cannot make them be there all the time and because it has to handle the spikes. Yes? Uh, uh, is there any recommendation of the instance types that you're using? And are you using Spot? I don't know if you're using AWS, but are you using Spot or? We use Azure and we don't use a Spot instances because pricing reasons or whatever is not worth, I guess, uh, but I've done it in the past, just use spot instances for things, uh, I don't know, like Jenkins builds, you can just, on Kubernetes, just use spot instances if you don't care 
If sometimes a build fails because there's no spot instances, you can wait a bit more, then that's fine. And the types of nodes, uh, I we use a standard ones. We look at that, we look at the um, proportion. Basically what we measure is the proportion between CPU and memory that our application uses. And then we went and looked at uh, VMs that have that proportion. Because ORS is pretty normal, I'd say. But yeah, if you have like high CPU usage, then you would go with a high CPU to ra ratio, CPU to memory ratio and so on. So it depends on your use case and also depends if, whether you mix workloads or not. But, but would you prefer like large nodes or too many smaller nodes? Oh no, we prefer large nodes because there's also a limit on how many nodes you can have. So the larger, the better, typically. So I'm wondering if you could go into more detail yeah. Yeah. Uh, about your JVM configuration um, and the memory usage. Um, uh -huh. I think the newer, right, the newer um, garbage collectors are able to release memory to the operating system. Yeah. We mm -hmm. didn't have a, f a really good experience with that, so I'm wondering if you could share your insights. So one thing, so we don't let the, um, the default JVM algorithm to decide how much heap. We uh, set it, I think it's 75% of the available of the requests. Um, because that was, we don't have anything off heap, not much of heap memory. Um, 75 was like the safe high uh, number. You also have to consider the JVM changes the defaults based on how much memory and CPU is available. So I wouldn't recommend sticking with the defaults because then you're gonna get surprises Maybe you're using pods with less memory and then now the JVM suddenly changes your garbage collection algorithm. It changes your, uh, your amount of heap and things like that. So it's better if you always set it explicitly to what you need. And yeah, it was mostly memory, setting up the right memory. In this application case, we want the heap to be always the same amount. We don't want it to go up and down. Uh, you could also set that, you could say minimum, maximum, but that also, uh, yeah, is the garbage collection working and things like that, yeah. Um, yes. I have a question over here. Where? All right. Uh, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, at my company, we came with similar solutions, although probably a bit more crude. Mm -hmm. So my question is, um, what's next? Um, do you have any ideas of how to be more, um, make a better use of resources? Um, yes, so we want to improve hibernation a bit more. Um, and we are looking at, I'm trying to figure out which one I can tell you about. Uh, we were looking at the different uh, VM sizes, but we kind of left it uh, not for now. It looks good enough for us. As we start mixing maybe different workloads, we may have to revisit that. And probably increasing the CPU usage, making sure that people, because our CPU usage is very low in average, then we have times where there's a lot of traffic, uh, Black Friday, whatever, and then, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're looking now more at other costs that come on, it's, it's not so much about the infrastructure le level, but it's on how, how can we pack more customers into the same clusters? Because not, not only increasing the usage, but also having bigger clusters means less maintenance, less work to do. So it's not directly on resource utilization, but it's also in how to reduce the cost of operating the whole thing. Less overhead. I think we have time for uh, one last question down there. Um, one question over here. Um, Carlos, so I've been reading over here, the back. I've been reading a lot about um, uh, not setting CPU limits. I mean, I've been reading about 
people not recommending setting CPU limits on pods. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been trying to implement that at our company. Um, we just did that recently. What's your opinion actually about that? Yeah, I was looking at that recently. Um, so what happens, if you don't set CPU limits, uh, your, your workloads uh, basically are going to share based on how much they request. So you have two pods requesting one CPU, they are going to share the CPU 50% uh, of the time. The problem is when you have pods that request a huge amount of, mem of CPU, uh, like things for our customers, uh, so they have, uh, I don't know, four CPUs or eight CPUs, whatever. But then you have cluster services that you want always running uh, that, request, but that only need like operators or something that only need 0.5 CPUs. So now suddenly this workload can take a lot of the resources of the node and this other workload, which may be critical for you, is starved. So that's the balance uh, why it's not clear for us whether we want to remove the limits or not. Thank you. Excellent. I think that concludes the uh, QA section. If you have more questions for Carlos, please take it outside. Uh, and don't forget to rate the session in the, in the app afterwards. Thanks, Thank everyone. You.